evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. Eighty-nine point three Mahoning Drive-In Radio. Your old friend Virgil back once again for another exciting episode of the podcast. As you guys know, the only podcast dedicated to the love and revival of our beloved drive-in culture. Joined as always by my co-host and general manager extraordinaire Mark. Say hello, Mark. Hi there. And we got Jeff, owner projectionist extraordinaire in the house. Say hello, Jeff. Good night, Dick. <laughs> Every time, you never know. If somebody that. didn't know laughing, they would think he was insulting you right now. But he's referring <laughs> to the fine variety television program of the '60s. Oh, come on, folks, laughing. This is right up our alley, and uh, we're really excited. The off season is always the hardest time of the year because it's a different type of work, which we talk about over and over again in our series here on the podcast, but. The community aspect, the seeing everybody every day, um, it really just wipes away. And we go back to our our old lives, you know, our regular lives. Um, and it's really hard. And uh, it's really exciting whenever we can bring a family member on board for a special podcast record. And that's the case today because we got our concession manager, uh, Mama Beth. Welcome, Mama Beth. Yay. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's been too long. It really has. How's things been? Good. Slow. You know, it's the off season. I know. It's the yeah. downtime. Yeah. It's you the downtime. You fall into a different groove. Like I was saying, uh, you know, during the season, I couldn't imagine like catching up on reading a book or playing that game or, you know, watching, diminishing that movie stack that I have here. So the off season at least gives a little bit of uh, extra time to, uh, to take in that stuff, you know? Well, and it's nutty for us because we're coming in off the off season and then we literally go right into the holidays. So it's like busy, 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 a little pause. And then it's like busy, 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 busy again. And then everything kind of quiets down for a little while. So, you know, it's been good. By the time we get to the end of the holidays, it's, you know, we're announcing shows again and the excitement's getting back up, which right now for people in the timestamp, we're in March. So we're about two months out from our 2023 season and people are freaking out about these events. Uh, have, have you been getting the messages from everybody and feeling the excitement? Yeah, absolutely. I know on my Instagram and those kinds of things, it's been going crazy. Yeah, we couldn't ask for better, you know, and mm-hmm. that was our big push this year is to try to get it is every year, but it's always a challenge. This year, we seem to be very on top of it where we can just get the events out, let people plan well in advance. A lot of our events now are out three months before the actual showing. And from what I've been hearing from people, they really appreciate it because it allows them to, you know, request off from work or find a sitter or whatever they have to do to make a Mahoning event happen. It gives them time to plan. And it gives them time to ask me what kind of specials I'm going to make this season. And I haven't even started thinking about it yet. So, (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a perfect segue. It's amazing how many uh, people are always wanting to know what's going on in the concession stand. What's the magic uh, behind the concession stand? What makes it click? And uh, Mark actually went to the Patreoners and we got a slew of questions. Am I right, Mark? We did. The Patreon members always deliver with insightful, if not absurd, questions. I want you to know. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know what they're going to ask, right? <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So, yeah, Mark, if you want to uh, fire away at some questions, we can uh, please the audience out there with their burning questions. All right. This one might be, honestly, might be the trickiest one of all. What are your favorite Vincent Price films by decade? Oh, wow. They know you, Mom. Like favorite 50s, 60s, 70s. I guess you could go 80s and 90s. You know, it was so weird because you actually sent me that one to give me a heads up. And I went through and I actually made a list of all of the Vincent Price movies that I've watched over many years. It's, It's hard by decade. Like, I found it so hard. My favorite Vincent Price movie of all time is probably Theater of Blood. I love that. I absolutely love that movie. That one's my favorite. Perfection, you know? It is. It is. 
it has like a nice mix of all these different things. And he plays a lot of different characters in the movie, like Mark will know. You know, oh, like when he comes out and he's like, my name's Butch. And he's got like the big afro <laughs> the thing on his head. Like, yeah. Yes. Yes. And when he feeds the guy his his dogs, I mean, it's just fabulous. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of food, that's a great culinary scene in that. <laughs> <laughs> there is. There is. Yeah, that's a showcase for him where he really shows off his range, you know. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks of Vincent Price as a certain character, but like the all the different characters that he's played over time, it's such a, a wide range that he has. I do. I recently just watched Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine <laughs> and Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. Yeah. <laughs> which were absolutely hilarious. Um, I think when he comes out in his little gold toed shoes that are like kind of like rolled and curled, you know, it was it was just a different role for him to play. Like he definitely could have been like in Austin Powers and definitely been, you know, that goofy, <laughs> funny, you know, you Dr. Kind of I think yeah. those were uh -huh. definitely uh, an inspiration for in part for Austin Powers. And that second Dr. Goldfoot was directed by Mario Bava, who's known Bava, as yes. a serious, great <laughs> horror movie director and that and then that. <laughs> Yes, but there there are so many of them that I enjoy. Definitely a lot of his Edgar Allan Poe stuff, The Pit and the Pendulum, The House of Usher. Yes. War Gods of the Deep, if you've never seen War Gods of the Deep. That one's a hard one to find sometimes, but that one's fantastic to, to watch too. Least favorite, Scream and Scream Again. I was not a fan. That one's weird. Just didn't do it for me. It is, it's very strange. I don't think he really plays a big part in it either, if I remember correctly. No, it, that one feels like you, you've you watched like a feature film cut down of like a four part TV show or something. It, it, did, yes. it, it like throws you into the middle. It's it's very strange. Yeah. And by decade, it's a little bit hard. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I just so enjoy weird. like a lot of them. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, he, he did a lot of movies early in his career, but it wasn't until he got to be, you know, do like House of Wax where he really became, you know, well known. We'll that was say. like phase two of his career. You know, he yeah. wasn't the horror guy until I think that movie. And then mm -hmm. he just took off. And he still, he did a, occasionally, he did this movie, The Whales of August, very late in his career. He still did the occasional drama or comedy. But for the most part, he was just the, the horror icon. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen like The Baron of Arizona. I want to be able to sit and watch that one sometime. That's one that I always point out to people because it's so unusual, but the plot, apparently based on reality, the plot is like mind blowing in the Baron of Arizona. And it's really just like a drama, historical drama. But yeah, yeah that's one I always highly recommend to people. House of Long Shadows. I mean, you know, he just, he worked with really great actors. And I think it was just a different time for horror too. I'm not a big, huge horror person per se. I think I go more into like those, like psychological kind of thrillers. I don't so much like all the blood and gore. So I think when you watch those older movies, they can just be fun. And, you know, you're a little bit scared, but in the same token, it's not like bloody and gory and disgusting. Right. Yeah, the, the slasher genre is a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. You could still be a horror fan, but not love the blood and guts aspect of it all. I was going to say, uh, talking about before he kind of hit again, it's strange to see these horror icons in their early days. I recently saw a picture of a young Bella Lugosi and a young, who was it? Um, but it was it was striking to see them like in their you know twenties. Well, you don't you don't know them as that that movie star, you know. In those early roles where they were being you know, sort of tested out as leading man or romantic lead and things like that, which Vincent Price did. In those early Lugosi shots where he's dressed as Jesus or something, have you seen those? No. I'm intrigued. Very interesting. Look that up. I'm intrigued. Now I have to look that up. I have a new wallpaper for my phone now. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> 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 well, I got to say, Mama Beth definitely inspired our Vincent Price Twice double feature. Um, I got to give credit where credit's due. The Vincent Price Twice actual title was in the suggested double feature box. There was no titles with it, just Vincent Price twice. And I was like, that's too good not to do. So, but you really helped us zero in on the the crowd-pleasing titles that people might want to see. 
I remember you coming to me and asking me and giving you a couple of suggestions. And then I said, I would definitely hit up Mark because Mark could probably give you some suggestions as well. Because yeah, I know well, people want it to are. come back. They really do. They ask for it. So we might have to put our heads together again. He has so many great titles. We could do that for years if it's just two movies at a time. That was a fantastic turnout, too. We had a lot of people on the lot that were really, really excited to see those movies. So on a Sunday, baby, on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was busy. Yep. That was a question from James Bracciante, who also wanted to point out, in, in his words, the Mahoning French fries are on point. And as a vegetarian, I always appreciate the plentiful options. Keep up the great work. Oh, well, thank you very much. I try. We all try. Now, Pete says, what happened to the John Denver poster? <laughs> <laughs> what everybody really wants to know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, if you had a hand in, in, in dismantling the John Denver poster that used to be on the door of the snack bar. I don't know. No, I don't think so. Okay, you can't pin it on her. No, I don't think that was me. I'm, I'm totally missing out on that one. I want to say it was, oh my gosh, maybe 2018? Well, when did you officially start with us, Mama Beth? 2019? 2020. Uh, yeah, because this will be... This will be my fourth season with you guys. My third season managing the stand. All right. Time All flies. Right. Well, yeah, I remember there was a revolving. That spot is coveted, you know, because it's right there on display. And now it's so tough because there is no space. Everything is, seems to be uh, filled. But it was a revolving. I remember we had the Spuds McKenzie for a while. Remember that, Mark? That was actually my poster. That and the job. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. That was not me. And the kids in the stand probably would have asked me who he was. And then I would have had to explain to them who he was. That's probably why it worked its way out, honestly, is because the kids were like, what is this? This isn't him. Get this out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tom Bufulco asks, why isn't there more Moxie in the fridge? Because oh. Dave drinks it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to find. It's funny because um, the Moxie was actually a Rob purchase. So Rob, for a while, was purchasing some sodas and that kind of thing to intermix with certain things. But the Moxie, he always said, was hard to find. I will put yeah. it on my list and I will try and make it a priority to get some Moxie in the refrigerator. You don't see it everywhere. What is with Moxie? No. Is it, is it a specific, like, um, you know, like area type of thing where? I don't know. Well, they, they sell a lot of it. They sell a lot of it in hardware stores because it makes great paint thinner. <laughs> <laughs> I am. We talked about this. I cannot do the cinnamon, you know, kind of flavored soda. I am out on that. Ugh. I had never heard of it before until I started at the driving. That was always one that my, my father liked it when I was a kid. Everybody that was as a kid. That was one everybody's dad liked. It is. It does kind of scream dad soda. Sorry, Dave. That's that's not cinnamon. That's blacktop. <laughs> hey, to each his own. There's a reason why black licorice still is sold in stores. Somebody's sure. buying that. I don't know who yeah. it is, but some maniac out there. <laughs> I think when Crystal and I tried it, she said it was like licking a cinnamon candle. I couldn't agree <laughs> with her more. <laughs> Yummy. Pick up a moxie next time you're at the Mahoning, guys. You taste it for yourself. The aftertaste is the killer. It sticks with you. It's one of yeah. those beverages. It was like we had Malta Goya for a while. I remember Matt yes. saying that. Oh, my uh, God. It's one of those things that most people don't like, but some people love. And a lot of yeah. people are like, oh, I've never heard of that. I've never tried it. And they would buy it. With the Malta Goya, I said that was a great way to sell two beverages because <laughs> there was an instance where Carl bought one. He took a sip. He went out and spit it out, and he immediately bought a sun kiss to wash the taste out of his mouth. <laughs> it's a hook. That's fantastic. Yeah, I did not like that Malta Goya at all. That was like medicine or something. Somebody said it was yeah. like drinking dirt. I don't know. So Matthew Jasmine asks, here's the question you expected. How do you come up with the special items on the snack bar menu? That's what everybody wants to know. Everybody. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little hard. Sometimes they come right away. Some of them I recycle, to be honest with you. If they went over really, really well, like the Zomburger being one of them, that just yep. stays constantly all the time. Yeah. So that one's always a repeat. I can't promise you it's always mixed the same because I don't measure anything. I don't measure anything. I go by taste a lot of times, even when I cook at home. Like a recipe is like a guideline to me. I, I kind of use it, but I really don't. 
sometimes it's just starting with a name and trying to figure out what I want to name it and then trying to figure out what exactly it's going to be. A lot of times the specials are things that I might have of extra in the back. So like, you know, you saw a lot of pineapple-y barbecue sauce or whatever else because that's what I had in the back and I had around. And I can put that on a hamburger. I can put it on chicken nuggets. I can put it on meatballs. Meatballs were like a big thing too. And, you know, I try and think about things that are going to be the easiest thing for us to put together and be able to keep the line in the stand moving as well. You know, because we don't want everybody to have to wait for a special. So a lot of times that's why you don't see a lot of, I've, I've kind of moved away from like the burger specials because they take so long to cook and I hate having people waiting for right. a special. Yeah. yeah. You know, and on those really, really busy nights, like think like a camp blood night, I need something that's already maybe prepped ahead of time that I literally just have to put together on a bond so that I can get that line moving and keep it, keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. In talking to the um, other drive-in owners in the owner series, it's a question we ask everybody is, do you have a self-serve line or do you have kind of a, a stop and go, you know, single service window? And it's it's a whole other beast when you're dealing with self-serve and people kind of gathering what they want along the line. It cuts out preparation. To, there is no opportunity for preparation time. So when it comes to specials, I'm sure a lot of it goes into that and sometimes and I the inspiration i was gonna say sometimes the inspiration will really click immediately where you know i'll say you know we're thinking about doing this and you're like Bip, here's the special just pops right off your head you're like it's too good makes sense <laughs> and then there are literally times i'm like virgil do you know mark do you know i've went to james before i think when we were doing critters I looked at James and I'm like, I have no idea. What do you want? And he's like, I just literally want a hamburger with tons of stuff on it because I guess that's what they eat in the movie. You know, so it was, you know, sometimes it's just a toss together or, you know, I mean, it could literally be down to the last second. I'm like, I still don't have a special for tonight. I don't know what to do. So <laughs> Finding that inspiration. Somehow that's the magic in the sauce. You know, it's. Regardless, we know it's going to come to us somehow, some way. We're going to band together and find that perfect special. Um, do you ever get inspired by uh, requests from fans where they're like, you feel like I can't not do this or people will freak out? <laughs> mm. Absolutely. I think we had a suggestion for Bill and Ted yes, for this coming was, uh, season. Chase did that. He And he like drew it like an exploded view or something like that. Yes. I yeah. So I actually that. have yes. the graphic for it. I have the graphic for it and I will put it together. I want to say, was it lunch meat when they came and did 90s weekend? They wanted the cocktail meatballs and That's stuff. That's so right. Like, yes. yes. Yeah. So I will always work with anybody if they have a suggestion for a special, as long as it's something that I can put together in a, a short amount of time or prep ahead of time. Right. That was so much fun. Jo uh, the twist with Josh's podcast, uh, VH Snackin', is they watch a movie and then they have a themed eat that one of the hosts makes for the other. And yeah, it was really fun bringing those guys in. They came in ready, knowing what special they wanted. It's It was a really fun time. Mistress Zeneca asks, what are the unique challenges of such a small storage space to feed so many people every weekend in the season? What are your organization <laughs> tricks to fit everything back there? Oh, goodness. Um, Tetris, baby. Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And especially on those big weekends, like when I have to get like, you know, stuff from the restaurant stores. So like food boats and all those kinds of things. My Jeff went in and hung lots of extra shelving in the back, utilized the space a lot better than what it was. So I have so much more storage now. Yeah, sometimes it, it literally is. It's just putting milk crates on the floor and then putting boxes on top of that until we start moving the stock out. I think one of the biggest things was freezer space. Definitely freezer space. And, and we had one of our freezers go this season. So we had to uh, replace one of our freezers this season. So now we have a nice big chest freezer that's in the back that I utilize for, for buns and that when they come in for um, from our food order. That's the hard part, too, is, you know, you have product coming in practically every week. 
because of where we lay and the conditions, the weather conditions, certain things that you could keep out in your house, you know, and would have no problem staying out. For us, it's a challenge. And Rolls is the perfect example where it's like, we have a coffin sized freezer just to keep all of our rolls fresh from delivery to the time it hits your mouth. And the nice thing is, is that they come in frozen already. So there's no like unfreezing or freezing until I take those rolls out of the freezer. Early on in the season, the rolls can stay out. And later in the season, the rolls can stay out longer than they can during like those, like I want to say June, July, August times, because otherwise they'll just, they'll, they go bad so fast with the humidity in the back. Do you find that uh, there's certain things that you almost can't buy in bulk because either storage issues or whatever the case where you find you're just kind of grabbing as you need it? I see you do that a lot for specials in general. Just generally for specials, if there's something that I need. But I mean, you figure, so when you look at my freezer space, I have a chest freezer just for hamburgers. We have a chest freezer just for chicken fingers and chicken nuggets. And anybody who goes in the back and works with me on a regular basis knows that that's the freezer that chicken fingers and chicken nuggets go into. This is the one that the mozzarella sticks go into. This right. is the one that, you know, whatever goes into. And then I have extra storage in the back that the, the freezer in the back is primarily for extra stock. So we always have like extra stock French fries and tater tots, pierogies, all those kinds of things. And they're always in the back. It's crazy. You know, it's a, uh, and that's another thing, again, talking to the owners, it's a, it's, I have to ask them because we struggle with space constantly. I want to know what the layout of their concession stand is. How much storage do you have? How often do you need to order? You know, it's like some people that have uh, the luxury of the space, it's, I'm so jealous of them, but that's the challenge of any business. You kind of work with what you got. I mean, in dry stock too. I mean, like when dry stock comes in, let's say like our soda and that kind of thing, because we're going to have a big weekend. I mean, like literally my whole back wall in the back was just taken off by like soda. The wall of soda. And, yeah. and like sometimes that only lasts maybe a weekend, depending on, you know, how busy the weekend is. It's it's tough to gauge. It's tough to gauge. And it's, it's, it's a juggle sometimes. It really, really is. I will just have stacks of things sitting on top of other things until, like I said, things start moving out condiments those kinds of things yeah yeah and it's the constant communication too where it's like to know how well a show is doing or going to do it's constant back and forth with mark jeff myself and then i think for me it's just that my crew knows where everything is where everything goes so that they know what's being used first because you know i do i rotate my stock so every time a new food order comes in that stock comes in and it gets pulled to the front and the new stuff goes in the back so that old stuff is coming out before that new stuff does. It's just a juggle. Brett Ryan Bonowitz asks, when figuring out prices and guiding margins on each item, is that something that is designated by you or a larger discussion with Jeff, Virgil, etc.? Do you look for lower cost, higher margin items while stocking? So on my end, I've only raised the prices once since I was manager in the stand. And that was last season, I want to say. Right. So what I did was I went on and I do like unit prices like anybody else would, you know, price per unit. So, you know, figuring out a price for that we pay for an individual bun, a slice of cheese, a hamburger patty. And then we figure out how much that unit price is and then how much we would like to make profit wise on said hamburger. Now, when we figured out prices at the beginning of last season, we weren't getting food yet from the food distributor during the season we switched over to a food distributor so um that way all our hamburgers chicken nuggets french fries all that stuff was coming from one place which which alleviated a lot of stuff and honestly i think it brought a better quality item to the drive-in as well i think we can oh, all yeah. agree yeah uh, I think <laughs> so, yes. that was the Absolutely. game danger you know and it really did uh lend to kind of the flow of our business as well. The days of us going and shopping for a weekend, you know, it's like we've well outgrown that, you know? So having somebody to uh, to really supply us with quality product and, and kind of more importantly, bringing it into us. So 
we're not constantly running around stocking up every day that we're open. It was a real game changer for sure. Yeah, it was really, really nice. Um, ultimately, I, I worked with Nancy on the pricing because um, Nancy does uh, my inventory in that. So she inputs all my orders. We sat together, we figured out pricing in that. And then we went to Jeff and we went to Virgil and we said, look, this is what we're looking at. I try whenever there are any changes in the stand to either talk to Jeff, Virgil, or both of them together. It's never like I just decide that this is the price everything needs to be. I'll tell you, I, I appreciate that, but I really go on your recommendations, though, because I think you're very knowledgeable about what you've got back there and about what you're selling to the public. And uh, I go a lot on your recommendation, but I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it should definitely be us as a whole discussing prices or anything like that. I would never just decide to, you know, charge $11 for a cheeseburger because, you know, right. I can right. or I can. Right. Right. And people love you. Yeah, well, we love you too, but I'm sure the customer loves it as well. Because from the beginning, our motto has been trying to pass along the savings to the customer. And our pricing is compared to any other movie theater it's it's extremely low and really what we're uh, making as far as a profit margin compared again to the regular theater market is it's generous and that's what we want to do we want people to come and be wowed by that and have that be an appeal for why they want to bring their whole family back the next time right Will Schweitzer asks, is there a food or beverage that you want to make available at the snack bar, but it isn't feasible? Oh, boy, Ooh. that's tough. Yeah, I know. Jeff's going to say pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But I but I, I tease Beth about it because I, I understand why she says that. We've always served pizza in the past, so I like to kid her about it. But I can understand why it takes more time. It's harder to do. Would I like to see it come back someday? Yes, but I value Beth far above pizza. So it's like, you know, <laughs> well, it's funny because you guys Thank call you. that old pizza oven. Uh, it's now labeled the slowster because it just, <laughs> it goes, it, it cooks rather slow. And again, because we have so many people coming through on any given night, it's just, it's so hard to make it, you know. I've always thought maybe at some point we could do like a, you know, like an outdoor truck or something that just like could handle these specialty items. But it's just, you know, talk about holding up the line, making a pizza and calling. And I remember when we used to do it and it was, you know, calling people's names out, getting them to come back and work through the line. It was never fun, never easy. It gets screwed up like you can make the pizza ahead of time and put it under a warmer. But right. then it's only good for it's only good for so long before it dries out. So if you have a bunch of people coming in and they want slices, that's great because you can cut it up. But if you have like two or three slices sitting in there and then somebody comes in and orders a whole pizza, that screws everything up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And can you imagine like a camp blood night and then having to try and call people on their phones to come pick up their pizza? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't exactly. imagine it. I can't. It, it would be the most popular thing and it would create madness, you know, eventually we'll get a, you know, a, 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 a quick, quick cooker. <laughs> I mean, I, I tried with the pizza rolls. I mean, I really tried. I, I you know, you just, you try and think of something that you fill the void. Will appeal. Yeah. You will, the appeal. Void. will appeal. I mean, funnel cakes would be a lot of fun. Again, the problem is, is that I have such a limited amount of fryers it's, yes. it's so tough to be, you know, to do those kinds of things. I mean, it's terrible because like you go to like a gold medal, like where we get our popcorn from and right. they have cotton candy machines and they're doing like cotton candy demos. And I'm like, I really <laughs> want a cotton candy machine. <laughs> where am I going to put it? You yeah, know? If we had the space, the amount of things that we could add to the line. But again, you know, it's... he keeps trying to talk me into a slushy machine and I'm like, uh, <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> and that's another thing. Like we have toyed with the idea of the fountain. You know, people have said from the beginning, why don't you have a fountain soda machine? And honestly, it's as much as it is a space issue and things like that, it's uh it's another step for the employee to have to do to, 
you know, take the time to fill that soda, level it off, put a lid on, blah, blah, blah. The, the, the ease of the line moving, it really depends on the amount of stops and amount of breaks any employee needs to take on that line. Yep, right. We talked about pretzels, for sure, with the fact that we don't have a pro like, um, not a proper steamer, but the steamer that we have needs some work, but... Well, that's going to be that's going to be hooked up this spring. I'm going to get it hooked up. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, the yeah. pretzels are impossible to keep moist um, unless you have the steamer. You know, even when I was running the indoors, it it was the biggest seller at 10 a.m., biggest seller at 10 p.m. People wanted those pretzels and pretzel nuggets, and it was a constant process: baking them, yeah. putting them into the warmer, keeping them replenished. It's it's, again, another thing that, uh, you know, we'll have to gauge as we go. Jamie Jaskett has a couple of questions, and I'll throw them at you one at a time. Would you ever consider opening up for a limited brunch offering for those that stay overnight? Oh, we get asked that, so yeah. I was going to say, we've discussed that in the past. Um, it's, it's a little tough sometimes because I am working with the staff that you see that work with me are the staff that I have. And sometimes there are times we're not getting out of that stand until 2.30 in the morning. And then to call somebody in and say, well, listen, you know, we're, we're going to do brunch in the morning. And uh, we're gonna be <laughs> we'll here see at you at 11 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I myself can't do it. I don't know how sometimes like I would see on Facebook, like all you guys would be at the gorge having brunch. And I'm like, how did they do that? We literally left that place like an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just and went I, to sleep. <laughs> and I, I think, I think for me, the problem is, is, I mean, and I'm only 45 minutes away, but like I get home and I take a shower and then like, I'm trying to go to bed and it's like five o'clock in the morning now. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, I know this is never going to work. I mean, it's it's a novel idea. It's a great idea. It'd just be a matter of you you literally have to have like two groups of people, one being the morning brunch people that maybe work a half a shift into the, the next day. And then right. that next shift that comes in and works that nighttime shift. Right. You almost need another crew to do that. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, and it's a juggle, you know, like it's uh, we all already juggle so much that the idea of serving breakfast just seems uh Hey, crazy. Virgil's always on the lot. You can hit him. Yeah. Up <laughs> hey, I, I tell people if they really need coffee, just rattle on the door and, you know, I'll have Nance <laughs> make you a cup. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, uh, we love Jamie and we love her daughter as well, who is constantly coming up to Mama Beth and saying, I can't wait to work here. She's the best. <laughs> uh, that is she's cute. How old, how old is she? I want to say she's maybe like a seventh grader. So what is that, like 13? All right. She's got a couple of years then yet, but uh, yeah. She's counting them. I know it. Well, I ran into them at a convention in the off season doing some promoting. And same thing. You know, she was all smiles. So excited to see... Uh, to see us and even her dad came over and said like you guys are rock stars in her world like she loves coming to the Mahoning and the fact that you guys uh you know give her the time of day it is it really does go the extra mile for them beautiful beautiful it's all about you know so she continues more of a comment than a question but you all are amazing there are points during the summer when I feel like I will pass out from the heat simply standing online and there are all of you not only working but making masterpieces in the heat you are all amazing. <laughs> it gets hot in there. I all we, we appreciate personally that. endless respect for all of the snack bar crew because I'm in the snack bar and I'm a wilting flower and you guys are over the grills dealing with hot food. I don't know how you guys do it. It's definitely like a work together kind of thing. And I think we just keep each other going. You know, I've I've yeah. got a oh my gosh, I can't talk enough about my crew. I'll start to cry. They are they've come so far. I couldn't do it without them. I couldn't. I, I, I can't thank them enough for, for being there with me all season long. And if something happens, I can call them and they will come in and they will be there and they will have smiles on their faces and they love being there. And I just, I can't say enough about them. I really can't. Yeah, that's they're beautiful. fantastic. And great. the development, you know, we <laughs> coming into this thing, you know, there wasn't really a set plan as far as 
how we're going to carry this into the future. You know, we took a lot of gambles along the way. And the development of our crew is something that we really started taking uh, seriously um, in 2019, 2020, when we made that shift and you came in. And you've done an incredible job taking these kids under your wing and really having it to the point where any one of those kids could pick up the slack on a day that you couldn't make it in and feel so confident that they're in control and have that power without any nerves that come with it. They're just so in tune with how that place runs because of you. Well, thank yep. you. Another question from Jamie. Is there a special that is your personal favorite? Mm. A special that's my personal favorite. I don't know. That one's a tough one. I can say for me, I I loved that. And I'm pretty sure it was under your reign. The Santa's secret sack snack or whatever it was called. We did like crumbled cookies in the, the popcorn. No, I don't think that was me. Oh my God. It was so good. So good. That was one that definitely. Well, I'll write that one down. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'll write it down for the future. Hang on. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Was that for the Santa Claus? Did did maybe Max come up with that one? I feel it, honestly, if it was before Mama Beth's reign, then it, you know what? It might have even been a Jess original during one of those Christmas shows. But yeah, I remember the whole joke being that it's the Santa sack, so every kid had to come through and. <laughs> request it <laughs> tickled us pink <laughs> all right and and finally is there any possibility of milkshakes ever being feasible oh goodness they bring goodness. all the boys to the yard from what i understand yeah what's wrong with my milkshake come on um maybe <laughs> there's so many things we wish we could do oh my god it's it's tough. Even talking again with the owners, you know, people will say what their their specialty is or what really sells. And I'm thinking, like, how could we prepare that? How could we ever store something like that? You know, like, we're just so uh, we just have to constantly juggle it. When you think about what we can store and we have a bigger stand than most people do and we still don't have enough room. Yes. I mean, I I was thinking about trying to put milk and ice cream somewhere on top of making sure that I have like. 600 hamburgers in a freezer and enough buns to go through a whole oh my god weekend. yeah if freezer space wasn't tight refrigerator space is even harder <laughs> the refrigerator Christ. space is ridiculous but you know why they bring this up because apparently you and mark were talking about milkshakes i'm probably one of the podcasts one time and who brought me the the milkshake machine at the end of the the year i think that was party. uh that was bob wasn't it yeah i think so yeah that's right bob weir yeah so i mean i do have a really nice old vintage milkshake machine but it, it's just it's it's so tough and the the problem is is it's just like um you know anything else everybody will want one and yeah. then the problem is is that that line is going to be out the door and around the building and it gets bad enough sometimes the the line goes out the door and around the building oh my god yeah <laughs> right Right. Well, your drink specials, like, that's what we'll do. We'll have to announce, like, hey, these are limited. We only have X amount of cups. We only have X amount of product. And every single time, it's like, it flies. Like, it's nobody's business. And that's the really great thing, I think, about bringing you in, Beth, as, as manager, is you really do have a sense of what the audience wants, uh, having that crossover and being... Uh, one of them not very long ago and uh, listening to them and knowing what that flow is and how it's going to come across uh, not just for their tongue, but for their experience. Yeah. I mean, I remember coming sometimes and it was really quiet. So you really didn't have much of a line in the stand. And then, you know, there were times we'd be there for camp blood or zombie fest and be like, yeah, we'll just give the stand about a half an hour and come back. <laughs> we'll wait till the line's not visible outside. Yep. Mm hmm. Donnie Morgan asks, what is something you have not fried yet that you hope to fry this year? Oh, <laughs> a pumpkin. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because a lot of people would think that we've probably fried a lot more things in it than what we've we've done. I mean, we've we've tried Eggo waffles in there. Yep. We've fried a hot dog. 
I'm trying to think of what else we did. I think we dumped tortilla chips in it the one time and fried tortilla chips in it. Um, <laughs> Deep fried pickles. There's um, some people I think think that it's like that we go the appeal of carnival food and we never really went that route. You know, like we don't use the deep fryer for much more than really what we have to, you know? Yeah. And again, it's because of the limit of space. Well, and I try and watch what goes in there too, only just for allergy purposes. So a lot of times, you know, I try and just do French fries and, and tater tots and those kinds of things in there. Like no chicken goes in the big fryer. Right. So, you know, I really try and watch what, what goes in there. We love Donnie Morgan. He came to the Mahoning late last year, but he got hooked so hard and uh, he's constantly messaging me in the off season, just being like, I cannot wait to get back to the Mahoning. So <laughs> that's the excitement that we love and uh, the love that we get from our fans. It's beautiful. So our final Patreon question is from Mr. Brian Wallace. If the mayor of Flavortown were, were to consider drive-in theaters for diners, drive-ins, and dives, and visit Lehighton, what food item would you show Guy Fieri how it's made? Wow, talk about a guest, dude. Imagine that line. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we definitely have to pick a really good special. I would probably go with my Zomburger. Because that one has, like, transformed and stayed with us. And yeah. nobody ever writes down the recipe. I just kind of figured out the recipe as I went along. And everybody was like, ground beef, something spicy. Just keep making it really spicy until people can't stand it. And <laughs> it's just like, like flowing from there. So I think that would probably be definitely one of the things that I would make for him. I mean, although Virgil really did like my pineapple meatball barbecue mixture oh. thing that was going on that time. See, Jeff knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Too. Oh, <laughs> those were really good too. Yep. So uh, that Mahoning squirt, I'm telling you, sometimes it's just the, the extra little, uh, the, the extra little magic, you know, that you put on top. It's like, yes, these are just meatballs, but then you add a little Mahoning squirt sauce on top and it's like, you know, take me to flavor town as they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mark, you better edit squirt sauce. That didn't sound too good. <laughs> I did That's push that pretty hard. It. Yes. Yes, you did. And I said, no way. No I just way. like how, how everybody's face turns when I say, can I get the Mahoning squirt? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got any squirt in the back? And everybody looks yeah. like, what? Like, hey. <laughs> Time now for your barbecue break. Treat yourself right now to that good old Southern style, just right barbecue. Steeped in taste tingling barbecue sauce made just right from fresh, firm choice ingredients, the recipe handed down for generations, and cooked southern style to tender perfection, slowly, hour after hour, capturing the taste-tempting barbecue flavor. It's just right tender goodness, generously spooned on a fresh soft bun for you. Mmm, it's hard to wait, it smells so good, and oh boy, it is lip-smacking good. Here it comes. Your southern style, just right barbecue on a bun with all the delicious trimmings. A snack to remember. Enjoy it now along with your choice of hot or cold drinks. It's a favorite of all the family. Just try the best barbecue in the land that made barbecue famous. It's southern style, just right barbecue. Uh, well, what we uh, plan to do and what we've been doing with bringing in some of our family members on the podcast is really giving us an opportunity to talk about movies that we love, uh, movies that have inspired us, some things that we're watching currently, whatever the case is. We call it the Off the Wall segment, which actually has crossed over into the Patreon. I've been recording uh, some short videos, highlighting some books and records and comics and things like that. So it's really fun. It gives the fan base kind of an inside look of what our taste is. So, Mark, for this one, did you have any kind of guidelines or are we free for a minute? Well, we, we can go either way. I had suggested because, you know, we associate Beth with food, being the snack bar manager, uh, maybe films that were food themed or had a memorable food scene in them. But if you don't have that, we'll, we'll talk about anything. I mean, certainly some movies come to mind when I think of food movies. 
but that list is pretty small you know like um yeah. direct kind of hey this is a foodie movie so i right away go to scenes you know movie scenes that involve food right and i have a hunch i know what you're gonna say because i'm thinking the same thing y you know i I could start with a lot of them, but because it's coming up and it's our go-to every single year, for me as a kid, there was no better escape food movie than Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It was like transformative, where you're like, the idea of walking into a room and being able to snack on anything. <laughs> yeah, everything is, everything is edible. Everything is yeah. edible. For a chubby boy, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, is that what heaven's like? <laughs> I always wondered what the mushroom was like when they stick their hand in it. It was like What's that made of? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so many question marks of like, how how could they make that? wonder what that's made out of. Could you eat that? You know? Or the always... vinyl balloon that all of a sudden they grab and they bite. And you're like, that is literally a vinyl balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Some clever editing, I think, in that, uh, <laughs> that sequence. But yeah, definitely that one pops to mind. Um, what about you, Jeff? Anyone kind of uh, jump right away at your head? Yeah, when you said movie scenes, I immediately thought of Animal House. Yeah, oh, oh come on, food boy! <laughs> you know, growing up watching that, and that was one of those movies that I would see on TV, heav heavily edited every once in a while, I always had this memory that that scene goes on a lot longer, and that scene... Almost as soon as he says food fight, it cuts. But it was always made out in everybody's memory to be this like big food. To me, the scene that's even more food related is right before that where Belushi is loading up his tray at the, uh, yeah. at the, oh, the yep, pimple area. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen yeah. customers do that. <laughs> <laughs> when I was working that register, you'd see somebody, like one person, I got four cheeseburgers, I got three fries, I got a long night. <laughs> Sometimes we see that two or three times a night. So <laughs> and people would often come up to me and they would have a lot in their tray and I would look at it all and add it up and they would always say, oh, sorry. And I'm like, well, don't apologize. Please, we encourage right. this sort of behavior. This is what keeps Yeah, the, the higher the pile, the better for us. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't judge. I That's always right. say I don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Beth? Where does your head go with the... Uh food scenes it was so funny because mark sent it to me and i was like food related scenes in movies oh my gosh where am i going with this yes. so um i went totally crazy and i always think of like indiana jones and the temple of doom oh oh and, and you know what the worst part is is that before they even get to the castle where they eat monkey brains and all sorts of weird things they stop in that small little village and literally it's like a pile of like slop that's on the plate. Oh, yes. And and he's eating it and she kind of looks at she's like, I can't eat this. And like he goes, this is more than some of these people eat in a week. And you're embarrassing <laughs> me now. You need to eat it. And all you eat hear it. is like that sound effect of her going. <laughs> and you're like, it's like <laughs> stomach turning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think he's watching that as like a little kid and then they got to this castle and you figure it's going to be like this lavish meal of whatever, you know, and they get there and it's like snakes that they cut open and like all these eels come across the table and yeah. monkey brains and, <laughs> you know, yep. all she wants is the soup and they lift the lid off and it's got all these eyeballs floating yes. in it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, that, that's, that's where my brain went. Like, yeah. I but thought I of that too, like, like you know. So the use of kind of gross food in movies, you know? There's those <laughs> memorable ones where it's like, ooh, that looks delicious. But yeah, the sound effects, the biting, like there's certain ones where you're like, ugh. What about you, Mark? Where's uh, where's your head go? Well, I I've got a list with a couple of feature films, but I'll go with the scene. Um, a Christmas Story, Randy showing mommy how the piggies eat. Oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> I saw that movie in the theater when it came out as a kid, and I remember the people laughing so hard during that scene that you couldn't hear the dialogue. Yeah. Every year, Val's a big fan, of, big fan of A Christmas Story, and for the last several years, every year we watch that around Christmas time, and she makes us the meal you see them eat in the movie. So we have meatloaf and mashed potatoes and red cabbage. And it's really good. And, You're a lucky uh, man. So yeah, and we actually, <laughs> she, as I as I speak right now, I had some of that for lunch. She froze it from back in Christmas time, and we're thawing it out, eating it now. So. Uh, it's a gift that keeps on giving. But yeah, that's a, a scene that I always think of, I think of food. Speaking of semi-gross food scenes. 
Yeah, that's such a great scene, though. It really does uh, solidify that uh, family relationship, you know. For me, I was thinking about, you know, again, the the gross out kind of scenes. So one that I remembered for sure, because we saw it up, up larger than life at the end of last season, was Nothing But Trouble when he eats that hot dog. Yes. That will, you know, that'll stick with you. <laughs> forever and has stuck with me forever uh watching <laughs> watching dan uh Aykroyd scarf down a dog but yeah that that one always grossed me out i don't know if you guys ever saw this movie but did you ever see the movie jack with um yeah robin williams that was a francis no, I don't think coppola I film it was and uh, you know ironically i saw it at a drive-in uh, the Bucks County twin. And I loved it so much. I, I saw it at the right age. Pretty much the premise of this movie is Robin Williams character ages like four or five times faster than everybody else. So when he's in like fifth grade, he's, you know, Robin Williams and but he's still only whatever, 10 or 12. But at a certain point, there's a clubhouse scene where, you know, it's it's the perfect camaraderie scene of these kids accepting Robin Williams, even though he's a big old man. And they make this concoction in a a bucket of like ugh, everything grows from like worms to mayonnaise to coffee to this and that and the other. And at a certain point, he takes a bite into it and it's like, ugh. But that's one that definitely yeah. uh, burned into my skull. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder. Yeah, I'll tell you. Any others for you, Beth? It's funny you mentioned Robin Williams because then my next one was Hook. Oh my God, the feast. They're sitting at the table and they're trying to get him to use his imagination in that. And they have that big, yes. huge food bite. And oh I think gosh. just sitting and watching that movie as a kid, you're like, I just wonder what that's like. Just sitting at a table <laughs> with like this massive amount of food. And then they're like throwing those cakes and pies at each other's faces. Like it was it's just all different so colors. Much fun. And oh my mm -hmm. gosh. Yeah. That yep. was a perfect, perfect scene. And I think it's just a great movie too. You know? It really is. Yeah. I think we only played it once. We did a right when Robin passed away, we did a tribute night of Jumanji and Hook. And, you know, this was the early days. We didn't get a humongous crowd for it, but seeing Hook up on that big screen was awesome. I'll tell you what, I did think of another one, but it's really disgusting. Uh-oh, look out. I can't remember. It was a Monty Python movie. I can't remember the name of it. Meaning of Life. Yeah, okay, Meaning of Life, where he sits there and he eats and he eats and he eats and he eats and, he eats and he, his belly keeps getting bigger and bigger yes. and the buttons pop. And then at the end, they give him one tiny little mint, and then it just all comes back up again. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that, I never saw anything like that before. Oh, my gosh. I, I would have loved to have that experience in a darkened theater. You know, just like Monty Python took it to a whole other level. One of the greatest events that we had as far as comedy goes was playing Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which, hey, that might actually come back this year. You never know. It's a great idea. Stay tuned. Uh, what about you, Mark? Any others jump? What were you going to say for your movies? Yeah. I do have a couple that I would recommend. Well, I have I have two on my movie list that came to mind. And it, this is the kind of thing where if you really sit down and think about it and, and look through lists, you'll probably find 400 films that fit the bill. But one is a movie from, I think, 1985 or 86 called Hamburger, the Motion Picture. Oh, yeah. It was like a cable staple. Came out in the theaters, hit hit VHS, and that was it. It's never been re-released on any legitimate home media format since then. And it's just this Porky's Police Academy-style movie about this uh, slacker guy who goes to, uh, I, I don't know if it's Hamburger U. It's some kind of a university to, to train you on how to like basically work at a McDonald's or something like that. <laughs> this company owns. And it's just... It's crude and saucy and goofy, and I always thought it was it has Dick Butkus in it, and I always thought it was funny. And it's the kind of thing that would be great to play at the theater if we ever could find a print and pair it with, you know, a movie people have heard of. Uh, but uh, yeah, hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> Any movie with Dick Butkus in it, we're gonna do our Dick Butkus marathon. <laughs> you don't it's funny because that has then 
that has been suggested and it gets suggested a lot with hot dog the movie oh that would be an excellent double feature you know hamburger hot dog goodness and we'll, we'll throw in fast food as the secret feature exactly Boom. i actually had that in my notes mention fast food with jim varney yeah yes can't go wrong actually, with that fast food and hamburger would be a perfect double because they're both about fast food restaurants hot yeah. dog is about skiing you know i think they called it hot dog the motion picture no, maybe it was Hamburger. It was called Hamburger, the motion picture, because Hot Dog had come out and was a big hit. The right. Same distributor was like, we get, if food movies are hot. So. Well, like French Fry, the movie next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, any other ones you had as far as um, features? Yeah, it's a movie that most people don't know, but I think it's it's getting a little bit easier to see. It's a broken lizard movie from within the last decade or two called The Slammin' Salmon. Wow, you I you know what I saw you review this mark for I did that uh, as a Patreon video. Yes. Yeah, I think it's on Tubi or something. It's not too hard to find, but it's the Broken Lizard, it's it's the Super Troopers guys, you know, as they do. They do these they did the Club Dread and they did Beer Fest and everything. It's all the same cast but in different roles and it's about uh, Michael Clark Duncan plays this sort of punch drunk uh prize fighter who owns a restaurant in Miami and he's basically really hard up for cash that he owes to somebody. And he tells all the waiters, you know, we need to make X amount of money tonight. And whoever makes the most will get a prize. And whoever makes the least, I'm going to punch out. And it's just totally <laughs> absurd. It gets more and more absurd. It's a great cast. It's super funny. And just not many people know about it. Yeah, underrated. Uh, yeah, broken very much. Any uh, certain, like, specific food movies that you go to, Mama Beth? Mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking about it. Like, what's the one with Stanley Tucci? I remember that was the biggie back in big my night. video store. The Big Night. That movie's yes. great. That that's a, that'll movie that'll make you hungry. Oh, fantastic! And it is. It's one of those movies which I gotta say it is a genre where like you'll see every now and then these restaurant tour movies come out. You know, the the cook behind the scenes. There's one called I, Chef that was done by uh, John Favreau. So that's on ago. my list. That's yes. a really good movie. It'll make you want to eat a Cuban sandwich. It's incredible. Like, you know, I have such respect for Favs, you know, not just as an actor, but like his whole career in general. And that was one that came out of nowhere, didn't get much attention. And I still revisit it pretty regularly. Uh, really, really great movie. And spinning off of that, this has nothing to really do with, uh, like, food movies, but it does have to do with John Favreau. IFC, back in the day, had a show that I was obsessed with. It was, like, the greatest show ever um, about five stars sitting around a dinner table dinner talking about the industry called Dinner for Five. And I own the first season on dvd they've never put any other ones out on physical media as far as i know but again that is comfort food for me like making dinner and then sitting down and watching an hour episode of you know five of my favorite random hollywood stars talking about you know their experiences while eating dinner it's just one that i can't recommend enough for people and one of those shows that, like, it's so hard because especially now the amount of content out there is crazy and things get lost within a week. But I want to say that show is what, Mark? Probably 20 years old at this point? Probably by now, yeah. That, that was done, uh, it was post-Swingers. I think it was after Made. So that was probably around the early 2000s or even late 90s that that started. God, so good. So, so good. So well, I can't it's kind of like... Having sitting and watching hot ones where they do the have you ever seen that with the hot sauce yes I, you know i've wings. seen clips yes and they bring somebody on and what is it like 10 sauces and every one of the sauces they ask them a question and some of them are fantastic and you get a little bit more insight into you know their their acting roles how they got into the business and those kinds yes. of things it's yeah. a fun it's a fun uh platform to say like hey we're going to watch this celebrity squirm with heat in their mouth. <laughs> and, and some of them do. Questions. They choke up. They're like crying. I mean, oh like, my it's, goodness. it's funny sometimes. It's I great. I get that. <laughs> yeah, we know. You're a One little dab. I'm done. <laughs> it's like, if it has coffee in exploded? it or hot sauce, <laughs> Virgil doesn't want it. Yeah, that's why I love you too, Mama Beth. You cater to my tastes. You know, I don't have to yeah, tell and, you. Yeah, <laughs> and no vegetables. 
It can't have vegetables in it. He That's goes, right. It's like, it. well, how did this green bean get in here? <laughs> I go, Virgil, Virgil, I need somebody to try my special. You're the only person around. He goes, is it spicy? Does it have coffee in it? Like, I have to answer like 10, 10 Break questions. Break the 10 criteria down. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm five. <laughs> we know. And then it. you'll tell Jeff. Oh, that, that special is so spicy. And I bring it into Jeff, and I'm like, be careful. Virgil says it's a little spicy. It's got a little kick to it. And then I come back, and Jeff goes, that wasn't spicy at all. <laughs> I had jalapenos to it. <laughs> yeah. Nance teases me all the time. I say I'm a terrible Italian. I really am. As you leave the theater, folks, please be careful. Don't let this happen to your car. Be sure to remove the speaker before you leave. If you should accidentally pull a speaker loose, please turn it in at our snack bar or box office. Thank you. Well, this was a, a ton of fun. Um, I really can't wait to get back in the swing of things at the theater. And obviously, once the, the theater opens, we're just in for a wave. But it's a whole other fun when we get to get in there before the, the gates open and prep everything and really kind of prepare for the magic. I'm really excited for some of the movies this season. Oh, what are you most looking forward to? Oh, Blade Runner. Yeah, you. <laughs> oh, so, so excited. Yeah, the uh, the calendar is stacked. You know, you guys know it. If you're hearing this uh, from afar, MahoningDIT.com uh, to check out all the dates and the deets. And we're releasing them pretty much every other week. I'm going to say it because it's the next one to come out. James has been bugging us for years, and fans really, to do a werewolf event. Uh, something that has to do with the werewolf. You know, we've done Vam Party. We've done Camp Blood. We've done Zombie Fest. They're like, where's the werewolf love? Uh, well, you guys are going to get the bite at the apple as we present Werewolf Weekend. And if that wasn't cool enough... We're expecting a full moon on both nights, so it's going to be a, a great time. Excited to howl at the moon, Mama Beth? <laughs> oh, yes. I will be out there. <laughs> oh, I cannot wait. With five cups. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Mama Beth, we always tell people when they're on, like, hey, do you have anything to promote? Do you have anything to do or this or that? Do you mind sharing your Instagram handle? My Instagram handle is mama underscore cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it yeah. so much. I wanted, I wanted it to be cheeseburger mama, but somebody already had it. So I am the mama underscore cheeseburger. Mama cheeseburger is a really great uh, handle. So it is. We love you so much, Beth. We can't wait yep. to get back in the saddle. And we thank you so much for everything that you've done and continue to do, uh, not just for us as a business, but for the fans that love this business. No, yep. thank you for having me. Absolutely. Great. And Jeff, on that note, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right-hand side of the screen at the front of the field, and most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night, and God bless you. <laughs>